The following episode of Butt Plugin with QDOT was brought to you via donations from godless perverts like you. Hi, and welcome to Butt Plugin with QDOT, a new show about butt plugs, the internet, and stupid shit that happens when you bang the two together. Now you may be thinking, hey QDOT, what qualifies you to talk about sex and technology on a source of truth like the internet? Well, I've been running the blog at metafetish.com since 2004. In that time, I've covered sex and technology, teledildonics, sex robots, and a ton of other topics. As a blogger, with no editorial obstacles in front of me whatsoever, I've now become an expert in sex and technology through being prolific and stubborn. Unfortunately, no one really reads blogs anymore. So I've decided to take my knowledge to video, where I can wave sex toys, as well as making fast movements and loud noises to make sure that I keep interest. In episodes to come, you can expect things like unboxing of toys, discussion of marketing strategies behind sex and technology, hardware teardowns, and overviews of things like movie and game synchronization, as well as experiments and user interfaces for sex toys. Now in this episode, we'll be covering the Fleshlight launch. This is Kiru and Fleshlight's new entry into the world of cock robotics. And much like the Nintendo Switch, both of them came out last month, both of them are already sold out, and we don't know when they're going to get more of either. However, unlike the Nintendo Switch, you're supposed to put your junk in this one. Now we'll be going over what comes with the Fleshlight launch, how the hardware works, how the Bluetooth protocol works, and then finally doing a full teardown of the hardware so you can see what's going on inside this thing. Let's get started. Now, usually when you're doing an unboxing, you leave the product in the box to take out while you're making the video. But when your mailman shows up and it's all, hey, I've got your new cock robot, like hell you're gonna wait to film that shit, right? So instead, we've got a flattened box. So anyways, uh, here we go, uh, the Fleshlight launch. Now, um, this isn't Fleshlight's first foray into computer-controlled sex toys, but it's most likely their biggest, uh, both literally and figuratively. In the past, Fleshlight's been part of things like the interactive Fleshlight, which was an air sensor that came out in like 2003, attached to the end of the Fleshlight and didn't work all that well. And the V-Stroker, a cap for the flashlight that contains an accelerometer that would relay movements. We'll be covering these products in later episodes, but for now, know that the main difference between those and this is that those require you to manipulate the toy manually. The flashlight launch, however, is basically a replacement for your arm. This isn't the first toy ever to do that sort of motion, as there have been like fucking machines with Flesh, fleshlight attachments and products like the Toys in Motion Priceless. However, this is the first time Fleshlight has sold something that does it. Before this, the most technical Fleshlight got was the Vibro model, which just had a vibrator in it. And this also isn't the first time Fleshlight's worked with Kiru. So you can actually see Kiru Fleshlight. Uh, Fleshlight provided the inserts for the Kiru Onyx toy, which is this thing right here, this black tube. Uh, they made these little replaceable inserts and actually go inside the tube. Once again, we'll cover that in a later episode. But with the launch, uh, the partnership continues similarly because Kiru is providing the hardware and the online services once again, and Fleshlight is providing the insert. Now here we can see how they convey how the toy is used. Put the flashlight in the launch, it moves it back and forth for you. But here's the tricky part. Flashlight masturbator not included. I've noticed more toys these days requiring inserts that they don't come with. Uh, the Vores A10 Cyclone has the same problem. If you order your toy but you don't have the insert, well you've got a fuck tube with nothing to fuck unless you're really into hard plastic. Obviously, the, having the inserts is kind of a recurring revenue deal and a value add, but it's still kind of surprising that they don't ship with something as it seems like an incomplete product, especially in a context like this where once you get it, you're gonna wanna use it. Now, next up, uh, the specifications part of the box. 
First off, body safe. Assuming you trust the safety ideas of someone who thinks your heart is in your pelvis. Uh, Bluetooth, because wireless are primitive. Rechargeable via USB. Warranty, though God help the poor shipping department that handles the RMAs for this thing. Um, 180 automated strokes per minute as shown by arrows surrounding the profile of a flathead bolt. Software updates via rotating CDs. Cock robots are not exempt from skeuomorphism. Uh, password protected. I have no idea what this one means. I've never actually run into any sort of password requirement on the hardware itself. It doesn't even use secure BLE bonding. I guess it's possibly uh, referring to the services that control it, but yeah, I'm not real sure. And uh, finally, FeelMe compatible. Uh, FeelMe.com is a new website that Kira have set up to control the launch as well as other products from manufacturers like Oh My Bod and Lovence and I Am Toy and at least one other. Uh, it's basically aiming to be a one-stop shop for internet butt plug content and control. The Connect side of the box gives you some idea of what the toy can be used with. Uh, first off is Lover, which since Kiru is part of the 268 patent licensing group, they can do without getting sued. Uh, same with Webcam for cam models. Uh, it'll also work with movie synchronization and virtual reality. Uh, all of these options will be hosted through feelme.com since that's pretty much the only place that anything for the launch is. So here's what comes inside the box, other than the toy itself. Uh, you've got your USB charging cable, you've got some lube, you've got a catalog of Fleshlight products, as well as instructions on how to maintain a Fleshlight. Um, you've got your quick start guide, the full manual, and this authenticity card, which is basically just a little cardboard warranty card. Now the quick start guide is interesting in that it uses the electrical LED symbol to show where and what color lights on the device are. It even has the different pin links for anode and cathode. Kind of an interesting choice for a sex toy manual. Now before the launch came out, there was a lot of talk about how large it was. Now that I've got one though, I realize that's not actually the case. Uh, we can kind of compare it with some similar toys to see what the difference really is or isn't. Uh, here is the Vora's A10 Cyclone. You can see the Cyclone is slightly thinner, but just as long. And uh, here's the Real Touch, which really ends up being about the same size. So all of these toys that have really nice actuation mechanisms that users usually enjoy end up being a little bit larger than usual. Now, comparing to other toys that weren't so popular or uh, as well liked, like the Kiru Onyx or the Levin's Max, you can see these toys are much smaller, but they also just didn't work as well. So it seems that with uh, toys of this type, you kind of need a larger footprint in order to get done what you want to. Now in terms of how to charge this thing, uh, the charging happens via a USB mini port on the back of the toy. Uh, full charge takes about six to eight hours, so if it's out of power when you're ready to go, uh, you're just hoping you're pretty patient. Now the toy's pretty useless without a flashlight in it, so uh, let's get one in there. Now, as you can see, the fastening mechanism resembles the lip of the fleshlight, uh, fleshlight body. So if we look in here, there's that right there, and there's that lid. So the same sort of slots. The fleshlight body just screws into this part. Uh, now, once that's done, the uh, toy is held in and can be moved by the motor. Now, the toy can be pulled out fairly easily, but that's usually not a problem, as there usually isn't any 
force on the case that would cause that to happen, uh, tends to stay fairly well seated while it's moving. Now here's where that warning on the box comes into play. What is a standard size flashlight anyways? So I've got three flashlights here. And first, uh, well, we've already got this gold one in. This is the stamina training unit. This is flashlight's most popular style. It seems to actually work okay. It holds in pretty well. It's not the snuggest fit in the world. I can just do that but it works. It's probably not gonna come out while you're using it. Uh, next up, uh, there's the Fleshlight Ice Jack. This one's pretty popular because it's their only clear model. Uh, as you can see though, it ends up being a little large, so you have to kind of tilt it in. You can still jam it in there and have it basically hold. But probably not the way Fleshlight re recommend you to use the toy, but if it's all you got and you don't want to buy another Fleshlight, it'll do. Uh, finally, there is this. This is a vintage Fleshlight case, uh, probably from the early 2000s or so. It falls right through. Uh, I would expect the Flight or the Turbo or some of the other new cases that are kind of small to have the same issue. So what could we do to fix that issue? Well, 3D printing is a thing these days. So why not just 3D print some shims to make any toy fit in here? It doesn't have to be a flashlight. It could be a Tenga Flip Zero or another Own a Hole or something like that. And we're looking at doing that right now. If you keep an eye on metafetish.com, once we get our models created and tested, we'll be posting them on Thingiverse and Shapeways and possibly making a new ep mini episode of this about it. The on-device usage interface is made up of eight buttons. There's the power button, the mode button, and three touch buttons on each side of the device. To turn the power on, just hit the button. This also causes the motor to move to the home position. Now when the device is first turned on, it's in Bluetooth mode, which is shown in a, by this blinking blue light that is also a button. This will allow the user to connect to the device via another Bluetooth device like a phone or a computer. The light will go solid on a successful Bluetooth connection. Now, if the mode button is touched for a few seconds, it'll turn off, putting the toy in manual mode. In this mode, the buttons on the side can be used to change thrust depth and speed. Hitting the power button causes the toy movement to start and stop. Okay, to take a moment here for critique, the buttons on the side are absolutely awful. There's no way to identify where they are to touch or whether they're even being pressed or whatnot, as you could probably tell from me trying to control it there. You just kind of have to slide your fingers over them and hope you're hitting the right thing. Not only that, as we'll see in the teardown, the way the sensor pads are aligned means that it's very easy to hit two buttons at once without knowing it. While well, I understand that the buttons are made like this in order to alleviate mechanical failure, it just kind of makes them completely unusable, especially in situations that the machine is supposed to be used in. If this thing was sold with the feature of being able to synchronize with on-screen porn, meaning you aren't going to want to look at the device to figure out where to press it if you need to use the buttons, and even if you're looking at it, you can't tell when you're hitting anything, that's gonna become a very frustrating situation for normal usage. So if you're developing for this, I highly recommend just stay away from these buttons. Now, while I said that this wouldn't be a sex toy review video, I figured I would at least talk about one of the features you might actually need to use this toy. Not every penis is going to fit in this correctly, assuming you want to use it with your penis. The problem is there's going to be some people that are too short for the full width of the stroke. So let's get an idea of how long you need to be for this to be all the way out. Uh, 
Okay, so you're probably gonna wanna be at least four inches long. I believe the average is somewhere around 5.5. So, and that was from this to the beginning of the insert of the fleshlight. However, if you're just a little bit longer than that, but not too much, you could actually slip out of this and this will push itself right back on you. That doesn't sound like very much fun. Now, one of the interesting features that I think could be implemented for this, I haven't seen it yet, but it could be pretty easily done, is to actually set a thrust limiter in either the software or the firmware. What this would allow you to do is say, this is as far as I want the key or the launch to go. So instead of going from zero to 100, maybe it'd go from zero to 80 or something like that. Now it would treat this range as zero to 100. So all of the videos would work with it in the amount of movement you would expect, but it would actually allow the launch to support more body types and more sizes than it does by just having the full length all the time. So let's check out the Bluetooth features of this toy. First off, I'll show you the normal usage using Kiru's Feel Connect app. You start up the app, and this is on a Nexus 7 tablet running Android 6.0.1. It automatically connects to the device, as can be seen by the blue light. And then you'll go to the Feel Me website. Now, as I don't really want to get kicked off of YouTube in my first video, I've already got some porn queued up here. It's a rather rowdy blowjob. And if I hit play here, you aren't going to be able to see the video, but it will be synchronizing to the device. So as you can tell, well, it's moving, but that doesn't really look like the movements of a rowdy blowjob now, does it? There's a couple of problems with the way that Feel Me talks to the launch. Basically, Feel Me treats the launch, whoops, like you would a Kiru Onyx. It actually sends the same commands that, um, that it would for the Onyx to the launch. Now the thing about the Onyx is, it only has four positions it can move to. The launch has a hundred and you can choose the speeds between them. So it has to translate from move from positions one to four to move to one of a hundred positions at certain speeds based on timing differences in the packets. It doesn't work. The movie synchronization right now is really pretty poor. So here's hoping that Kiru designs a new protocol to actually control the launch as the launch versus just trying to reuse the Onyx stuff. So before we continue, I'd like to talk about one of the other issues that I have with Feel Me and the launch. Uh, and you're gonna have to excuse me because this is going to involve programmer art. So let's say this is you. And you have a launch on your head. I don't know why, but you do. Now, you want to be able to use that launch on your head with the Feel Me app. So what you would figure is you have your laptop over here and your happy little iPhone right here. So what has to happen is that your iPhone is talking to your launch via Bluetooth. Now, you might not wanna watch a movie on your phone. It's a small screen. If you aren't using v VR or whatever else, it'd be kinda of silly. So you wanna watch a, lap a movie on your laptop. So you start the movie on your laptop. How does your laptop talk to your phone? That's the question. And the answer is pretty goddamn sad. Because the laptop talks to your phone via a PubHub service. So somewhere out here is a server or a database or whatever, I don't know, cloud in the middle because it's just not a network diagram without a cloud. And so what happens is 
you start pulling your movie on your laptop, it can tell where in the movie it is, and it sends that information to some JavaScript that has a list of haptics commands, so where the toy should move and when it should move. So while you're playing the movie, it's going to send a, it's going to come up with those commands, send them out to the internet, send them to the server, and now the server knows where your phone is. And so the server is going to go back through the internet and over to your phone. And then your phone's going to talk Bluetooth to the launch. So let's go over that again. <laughs> you hit play on a movie. The movie sees that it's supposed to send a haptics command. It sends that haptics command over the internet to another server, which can take anywhere from 20 to 200 milliseconds. And then that server sends it back to your phone, which you better hope that's going to have really good Wi-Fi connection or whatever else. So we can still call this 20 to 200 milliseconds. And then it goes to the device, which we'll call that trivial timing for right now, even though GAT can sometimes be kind of slow. So overall, anytime the movie wants to tell your device to move, it can take anywhere from 40 to ha almost half a second, 40 milliseconds to half a second. That's a lot of time. That's anywhere from three frames of the movie to 30 frames of the movie. And that's going to desynchronize really badly. So not only are you getting bad commands because it thinks it wants to send to an onyx, then it has to go all the way through the network and all the way back to your device. That sucks. Now, the question is, why can't it send from, the device, from your laptop straight to your phone and back? Technologies exist for this. There's WebRTC. There's local web sockets. And the thing is, I mean, by sending this data out through the net, uh, Kiru and Flashlight can continue to get telemetry on who's using the devices for how long, so on and so forth. It keeps their payment systems up and it keeps them knowing what their customers are doing and how the devices are working. But even so, it makes for such a shitty experience. I was really kind of shocked at this, but that's the way things are. Now, one of the other problems with this setup is this right here, the internet. If you want to play with your toy, you need to have your laptop connected to the internet, have your phone connected to the internet, and then hopefully everything stays up and running. The problem is if it doesn't. If your internet disconnects in any way, that's the end of you having sex with this thing. That's one of my major problems with teledildonic products and networks. What is the fallback? If you're in the middle of usage, what is the fallback? And that's really why one of my main rules about this is don't send your sex through the internet unless you absolutely have to. Now, if this wasn't a laptop, if this was like another person in another geographic location, you have to use the network for that, and you're going to have to just put up with whatever you can get. However, when this is a movie on a laptop connected to your phone that's possibly feet away from it, that's just silly. Now, there's a reason that uh, Kiru did this sort of setup, and it's that Bluetooth desktop is shit. There is really varying amounts of compatibility depending on your operating system. On Mac OS, we've had uh, Bluetooth LE since 10.6. Uh, on Linux, we've had it with um, Blues, I believe it is uh, 5.24. So that's been around for three or four years now. For Windows, we get it next Tuesday. So for Windows 10, we only have Bluetooth LE on the creator's update, which comes out on April 11th. So without that, it's actually, you can connect to Bluetooth LE since the anniversary update of August 2016, but there were issues with finding devices inside of 
applications. The creator's update will finally make Windows 10 and only Windows 10 Bluetooth LE compatible. Everyone out there running Windows 7 or 8, you're kind of fucked. And not in the way you want to be. So what Kiru's network allows is all phones really usually talk Bluetooth LE these days. That's the thing that you expect your smart device to actually connect to. So they are guaranteeing that you can have a wireless, uh, wireless fuck toy connect to your wireless device that they know will work with Bluetooth, but that you can still watch your movie on a big screen. The only problem is their version of this solution takes this huge chain with all of these failure points inside it to do. And there's got to be a better way than this. Maybe with the creator's update, we'll finally start seeing better Bluetooth des uh, desktop support in a cross-platform way. But, ugh, so much network. Now, before taking the toy apart, let's cover what you can do with it via Bluetooth. We'll be using the RaunchJS interface, which I wrote, and is available on the MetaFetish GitHub or also via NPM as the Raunch package. This demo uses Web Bluetooth, available on Google Chrome on Mac, Linux, Chrome OS, and Android M. So first off, you'll need to be using the version 1.2 or later firmware for the launch, which if you've ever started feel me and connected to it with the launch, you've loaded. So now, let's connect to the launch from the website. You hit connect, it brings up a list of de launch devices that are available. You pair, and the launch is connected. You can actually see the button status change on the website as you hit the buttons. Also, we can set speed and position and make the toy move. So all we're sending over Bluetooth is information about what position the toy needs to move to and how fast it's supposed to get there. It's a fairly simple protocol. Also, the Bluetooth is basically just spamming us back with button information, though, once again, it's very hard to get those to hit correctly. Something I'm not showing here today but that is available is firmware loading over Bluetooth. Kiru was actually nice enough, I guess, to distribute their firmware in Intel hex format. And since we know the CPU that's in the uh, launch, which it's a PIC24, we can decompile that back into the object code and take a look at it, which means we might be writing our own firmware soon just to see what we can do with this thing. Um, keep an eye on MetaFetish for more information about that. Now I've gotten a few questions from users online asking to see what speeds that the launch can run in. Unfortunately, the Feel Me demos really only run at about three or four different speeds, and like 80% of the time, it's the maximum speed. So I kind of want to give people an idea of once you have control over Bluetooth yourself, what speed this thing can run at. Uh, first off, we'll look at stroke, uh, which is a function that I wrote just to move the device to its minimum and maximum positions as fast as possible. Okay, so that's as fast as it can move. Now, it can go back and forth much faster than that. I put like a second pause in between each movement, but still, that's going to be kind of your maximum movement rate right there um, in terms of how quickly it can get from one end to the other. Uh, you can also interrupt commands so that it could actually stop in the middle or something like that. Let's see what it can do when you move it as slowly as possible. So that's the slowest speed possible going back and forth. So you can have it slide down really slowly or you can have it really shoot back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of uh, speeds and positions that it can move to easily. So it's got a really kind of interesting dynamic range for haptics for a toy. They just aren't really being utilized by the Feel Me software yet. With the basic functionality of the toy covered, it's time for the teardown. Let's take this thing apart. Now, assuming you want to follow along at home, and I don't know why you would since I'm taking it apart on this video, you'll want a flathead screwdriver or two, pre 
preferably a pretty small one, and a small Phillips head screwdriver. Outside of the circuit board mounting, the toy is just a snap together model, held together by friction, a bit of epoxy, and prayer. So it mostly just takes force to get the thing apart. Now the only part that's really epoxied onto the device well is this rubber ring at the bottom. While taking this off can make things easier, it's kind of difficult to get it back on, so I don't recommend doing that. The mach machine will still mostly come apart while it's attached. So, first off, let's take the flashlight out. We don't need that anymore. And we'll be starting with this top ring portion here. Uh, this will come up and over this top lid. Then pressure can be applied and the sides will pop off. So this always falls off for me. Now what you'll want to do is press in on these two things right here. And they should give a little bit, at which point you can come forward. And as you can see, the lids slid off a bit right here. Then, get our screwdriver, come down the sides until you hear a pop. There we go. You can see there's where it holds right there. Sometimes the top might come back on, at which point I just redo this. And then get the other side here. And voila, we've got our front ring off. Note that the uh, Bluetooth button is stuck to this via a piece of sticky material, so you'll have to peel that off on the way through. It'll stick back on pretty easily, and for this teardown, it'll come off easily because this is like the fourth time I've taken this thing apart. Now, once we've got that top ring off, we can start taking apart the case. We'll start by loosening it down the back seam. And once again, it's just a matter of finding where the attachment points are and getting those to come apart. There we go. So you can see there's little clips right there. Well, maybe you can't see lighting. But anyways, these just attach under this other piece. So you want to push this down and apart. And now it's slowly coming into two pieces. Now, these are actually kind of difficult to get off the first time around because they are held on with a tiny bit of epoxy on the inside. Once you get them off, they'll still stick back on via friction, but they also come off pretty easily. Uh, I've seen multiple reports on the internet of these just falling off during regular usage too. So don't worry too much about it if they don't stick on or if you really want them to, you just super glue them yourself. They're not that big of a deal. So now we can start seeing the motor and the motor shaft in there. So we need to find the other attachment pieces. I believe they're up here. So really, we want to get this all of this stuff on the back note first. go. We're stuck on the bottom back there. So there's connection pieces right here that you have to bring off. And then there's this connector piece right here that helps if I have on camera. That right there. 
So once those come off, then these just come off to the side. And now we can see where the circuit board is, uh, as well as the um, touch sensors. So now we'll need to remove the front panel, and this is where things get a little tricky, uh, because the last thing you want to do is rip this thing right here. I've already done that once, and uh, these two upper buttons right here no longer work for me. So uh, Kiru, if you'd like to send me a replacement on this flexi circuit, that'd be great. Um, okay, so now we can unscrew the circuit board right here. So those are our four screws, and now we should be able to detach these pieces over here. So this front panel is held on right there, and over here, this whole thing's pretty symmetric. And this now comes up and out, so we have actually finished unscrewing it. Okay, so at this point, you're gonna wanna be really careful. This is where you can actually rip the um, flexi circuit. So, unfortunately, this is really hard to show on camera while I'm doing this this way, but you can take one of your small screwdrivers here and there's a little holder for that flexi circuit on the circuit board, which I'll here sh show here just in a second. You can push the holder out, and here we go. So, let me zoom in here and give you a little bit better view of our circuit board. Well, autofocus did not help on that. Okay. Okay, so here's our circuit board. Um, so we've got our PIC 24FJ64, um, GB004 processor. Um, we've got a microchip, um, I believe this is an RN4871, um, Bluetooth radio, also microchip. And then uh, down here, um, we've got our VNH5180AH bridge. So this is what the CPU is using to send power to the motor and uh, deal with direction. Pretty simple overall. Um, not a whole hell of a lot going on on the board itself. Um, and for those that were wondering, uh, this is that circuit board connector I was talking, or the flexi circuit connector I was talking about. So you can actually push and pull this little part in the front, and that's what either loosens or holds onto the flexi circuit. Make sure you've taken out the flexi circuit before you start moving this around. Otherwise, you're going to end up with buttons that really, really don't work instead of just sort of don't work. So uh, while we've got the toy part, we can take a look at how motor position is relayed to the CPU. Uh, if we look at the top of the motor right here, we can see this little circuit board. And I'm having a problem actually showing it on camera and I really don't wanna take the motor axis apart again. So just trust me that this is a YC52010. Uh, if you Google that, you'll find a reseller of Chinese parts that lists it as a uh, bidirectional Hall effect sensor. So this sensor has two outputs, the phasing of which can tell you which direction the motor is turning. And since it's a Hall effect sensor, if you see this little disc right here, that's a whole bunch of magnets that are going around and around, and every time one of the magnets passes the sensor, it ticks. 
So what we don't know is how many ticks we'll see when the motor is rotated once. And we still need to figure that out. Uh, so we'll need to grab the oscilloscope to check that out. Okay, so we've gotten all set up with our oscilloscope and turned the machine on. And now we can actually start seeing how the encoder works. So I've got the oscilloscope probe on one of the pins for the Hall Effect sensor. If I start turning the motor by hand, we can start seeing encoder ticks on the oscilloscope. So really what I need to do here is just mark on the uh, on the sensor wheel where just one point where I start and then move it around one full revolution while recording it on the oscilloscope. And then I can just count edges on the oscilloscope and figure out how many ticks we're getting. Uh, I went ahead and already did this and it looks like we're actually running on the P44 uh, or possibly the P48, if I counted wrong, um, version of the sensor. So we'll see either 44 or 48 ticks per uh, motor revolution. So while we have this open, we can also talk about how the motor finds the uh, home position when it turns on. Uh, as you can see, this is the actual attachment point for that cup that holds onto the flashlight. And this moves up and down with the motor axis when you turn the motor. So when it's finding the home position, all it does is moves this all the way to the bottom. And at this point, motor can't turn anymore. So while it's applying motor power, you're not actually going to see any more ticks coming out of that encoder. And so as long as they don't drive this down at like full power and actually back drive the motor uh, in order to like backlash it or something. Um, they can actually just use this pressing against this plastic stop right here to figure out where zero is every time they turn on the device and use this to home the encoder. Okay, so we've thoroughly field stripped the flashlight launch. Now let's put this thing back together. And there you have it, one reassembled and once again working flashlight launch. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the flashlight launch. If you did, please like and share this video. And if the Lord moves you, donate to our Patreon campaign so I can buy more toys to make stupid videos with. Until next time, stay butt safe.